Hello? I thought I turned, there, there it is. Keep going. Oh, I'm gonna do this as an attempt to stay relaxed because otherwise I'm motor mouth. Um, so um, I want to pray again just because I need it. Let's do that real quick. Father, I just want to come to you tonight and just thank you for your word. Thank you for this beautiful passage of scripture, Lord. Help us to see ourselves, Lord, as you see us. Lord, help us to realize how intimate you want us to be with you. Lord, give us a picture of the relationship that we can have with you and, Lord, all of the intricacies of that. So, Father, would you take this time and would you let the ladies hear what you want them to hear uh, and, and take me out of the way. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the resources, and, and I should stop and say, um, I did this study, if you've gone to retreats uh, several years ago, I did this as one of the sessions, and it was like drinking from a big old fire hose. And so I decided to break it down into five weeks. So, um, but one of the resources that I quoted then, and, and it is still part of it, but it's been broadened from this, is a, a little booklet called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. His name's Philip Keller. And it's a really colorful narrative about what sheep do and how they act and, and a shepherd's care over them and all of that. So um, if you would like, I think it's an enjoyable read but it's obviously scripture-based as well. So I just wanted to give that to you as a, as a something to, to look for if you, if you were looking for an, an extra read. Um, so I wanted, uh, this is gonna be a lot of information, tonight especially, but I want you to understand that I am sort of, you remember the old flannel graphs back in Sunday school and then the characters would come across it? So I'm gonna build the flannel graph tonight and uh, as the weeks go on, we're going to have the characters come across it, okay? So I think you'll understand more as we get into this. But I want to talk first about the author. It was David. And David knew firsthand what it was like to be a shepherd. We know that all through Scripture, but especially when he penned Psalm 23. It was from his personal experience that he wrote this. He used the picture of the tender care given to his sheep when he talked about God, our great shepherd. So I'm going to give you a lot of scripture, and I will definitely go slow enough if you want to jot those down, uh, the, the references anyway. But 1 Samuel 16.11 is, is pulled out of the story of when Samuel was coming to uh, anoint the, the first king of Israel. And God had told him to go to the house of Jesse. And um, he had multiple brothers, six or seven older brothers, and they all went through him and Samuel was conferring with God, nope, not that one, not that one, not that one. And he finally said to Jesse, do you have any other son? And Jesse said, I have one other. And David, so 1611 says, David was pulled from tending his father's sheep when Samuel anointed him as the next king of Israel. Sorry, he wasn't the first king, he was the next king. And then also David's experience as a shepherd gave him the skills and confidence to take on and defeat Goliath. So you'll remember that passage from Sunday school as well. In 1 Samuel 17, just a chapter later, uh, verses 34 and 37, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. And I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it, the lion or bear, turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So you understand he has great experience from being a shepherd. And it's not just uh, clicking your tongue, moving the sheep around. There's a lot more to it. Uh, Asaph, who is a prominent poet and worship leader, recounted the history of Israel in Psalm 78. And when he gets to David's life and reign in that psalm, which is specifically verses 70 through 72, he says, 
He, meaning God, chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. So there are also many references to actual shepherds in scripture, and I'll, I'll name a few if you want to jot them down. Abel, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Amos, and that is just to name a few. I'll repeat that. Abel, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Amos. So understand, Israel's culture depended on this profession and would have understood intimately all the references that David makes in Psalm 23. So my goal is for all of us to also understand all the references that David makes. So let's imagine ourselves as the sheep that we are, and let's put ourselves under the shepherd's care and read this psalm from a sheep's point of view. Now, I've chosen the ESV version because for my studies, that worked best for me. So that's how I'm going to read it. So, and I'm going to read the whole passage. But we're just going to uh, study verse 1 tonight. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever." Do you see how David immediately takes on the perspective of a sheep to his shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's, he's looking and talking to him directly. So let me define a few of those terms. The Lord, it's Jehovah, the one true God, it's Jesus. Make no mistake who David's speaking of. And the shepherd is one who tends to or feeds pastures or grazes his flock. So the author of Hebrews uh, in chapter 13, 20 says that Jesus is the great shepherd. So Hebrews 13, 20, Jesus is the great shepherd. Peter referred to Jesus as the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. 1 Peter 5, 4, the chief shepherd. Jesus himself refers to himself as the good shepherd in John 10. But David says, my shepherd. That's personal. That's one-on-one. -on -one. Can you sense the intimacy that David immediately displays here? It's almost as if David is the only sheep and is looking directly into his shepherd's eyes. That's what I want you to see. We are like David. We can have that same perspective, and that's my goal. So at this point, I'd like to stop and talk about the characteristics of sheep and then the role of a shepherd, especially in Israel. So again, for these to help us visualize and understand more what David is referring to when he mentions specific things. So let's become sheep, okay? Now I'm going to give you several lists today, and I already discussed with the morning ladies. I'm going to email these out because it's a lot, but if you want to take, take that down, that's great too, um, but I will send them to you. So characteristics of a sheep are they're social, they're docile, they're timid, they have well-developed senses, and they have lambs. Social, docile, timid, well-developed senses, and lambs. So let's go back and break those down. So the social aspects of a sheep, they prefer to be in large flocks and not secluded. Hence, one sheep wandering off alone is called lost. Do we as sheep do that? Do we tend to wander off alone? 
And we're not just doing our own thing. We're, Jesus sees us as lost if we're not part of the flock. Luke 15, 3 through 7 says, So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go look for the one that is lost until he finds it? Then when he has found it, he places it on his shoulders rejoicing. Returning home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, telling them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. It's a big deal. Sheep want to be together. And they also show signs of depression under stress and isolation. These sheep are very emotional creatures. Again, God refers to us as sheep over and over again, so we need to start seeing ourselves this way. Unless you've been an F F FFH or FFA, whatever it is, Future Farmers of America, you know, and you deal with the little livestock at the fairs, or you lived on a farm, I didn't know any of this stuff. So these are, these are new revelations to me. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do you hear this passage a little differently as a sheep? We're to spur one another on to not forsake meeting together. Don't isolate. Don't run away. Don't be doing your own thing. We are all one group. Another aspect of the social part of a, of a sheep is he, they build friendships. They stick up for one another in fights, and they feel sad when friends are sent to slaughter. In other words, they miss them. They know that they're gone. Um, again, I hope we can see ourselves that way and, and kind of put that into motion. One last aspect of being social, able to experience emotions, and I think we've made that clear, but they are fear, anger, despair, boredom, disgust, and happiness. Can you imagine? Sheep can experience all of that, and we as sheep certainly do. Um, I can so relate to the social aspects and characteristics of sheep. Um, yeah, I, I am that person who wants to be in the middle and I don't like it if I'm off by myself. So another uh, characteristic of the sheep is they're docile. Now get this, they're followers by nature, and they do best to follow, not be driven from behind, and we will address that later in the study. But I know a lot of us, including myself, can be strong personalities, and you don't necessarily think of yourself as a follower, but we really are, because at the end of the day, we all want everyone to like us, we, all, we really want to be part of the crowd. We don't really want to stand out. I don't. Um, and so I think we need to think that way. We, like, we need to um, have someone to follow. Luke 10, 27 through 28 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So again, that these really emphasizing there that they follow. So sheep are also timid. They're easily frightened, especially of loud noises and dark places. Um, we're going to get a real good picture of that whenever we go through the valley of the shadow of death, right? So sheep wouldn't like that very much. Uh, and it's best to speak to them in a calm, reassuring voice. So get a picture for the the shepherd is not someone who's yelling, barking orders from behind, but he is someone who is calmly directing them from in front so they can follow him. And with their well-developed senses, they have extra, excellent excuse me, peripheral vision, and they have especially developed hearing on a wider frequency than humans. Maybe that's why they can hear their shepherd's voice. Now, I'm going to read that same passage that I just said about them following the shepherd with different words emphasized. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch, snatch them out of my hand. And then also, just as a little kind of cute little extra, the lambs, they can walk in just minutes after they're born, but they often are dependent on their mothers for four to six months after birth. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, you'll recognize this passage. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. The lambs need to stick close to their mother, so that's also part of who the, sh who the shepherd has to take care of. So here's a summary of who the sheep are. They're meek. They're defenseless. They're humble. They're willing to take direction. They recognize their master, and they will follow his voice because he calls them by name. Now, I'll repeat that again. Meek, defenseless, humble, willing to take direction, recognize their master, and will follow his voice because he calls them by name. One last scripture for this section, Psalm 95.7. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So are you, how are you feeling as sheep? Are you getting a good picture of who you are now? So let's talk about the shepherd. Um, as sheep, we certainly need and desire leadership and protection, and that is his primary role, to care for his sheep and keep them gathered together. Think about that. They're out in open pasture. Um, and I'll give you a little bit more picture of that. So some background of the shepherds in biblical time. They were very marginalized. Shepherds were considered social outcasts, uneducated, unskilled, and spiritually unclean. They lived in the fields with their sheep day and night and were unable to follow the Pharisees' cleanliness and ceremonial law. So now we know who was marginalizing them. Religious leaders also maligned shepherds, and rabbis banned pasturing sheep and goats in Israel, except in the desert plains. So back in that passage that we first talked about where David was out um, tending to the sheep, well, in that same passage of Scripture, God told Samuel, don't look on the outer appearance, look on the heart. So good shepherds, the Bible describes good shepherds who were diligent, dependable, brave, and willing to risk their lives to protect their flocks. And David's already given us an example of that. They watched for enemies, defended the sheep, tended to the sick and wounded, and searched for lost or trapped sheep. The Bible also describes good shepherds as providing nourishment and refreshment, leading the way, and being concerned for the safety of each individual. So there's, he has that group, obviously, overseeing, but he understands and knows each one of his animals. And in, and in the Bible, this is also a model for leaders. Shepherds are used to represent leaders of God's people, such as Moses and David were, and Jesus and his disciples also use shepherds as a model for Christian overseers. And the Bible's description of a good shepherd is found in John 10, as well as Psalm 23. So lastly, uh, just that background part, God uses the lowly station of a shepherd to demonstrate his love the same way he brought Jesus into a lowly sta station. And if you remember, who were the first people that Jesus' birth was announced to? It was the shepherds. I think that shows you why God has such a tenderness for this picture of shepherd and sheep, and he understands the relationship there, and he wants us to understand it as well. So now, in, and we're going to talk about it more in the, the following verses, but to give you a, a visual of who that shepherd was, he was very simple. It was him, and it was two pieces of equipment. It was the rod and the staff, and that was all it was. So the rod, um, I don't know about you, but when I think of these two pieces of equipment, I think as a sheep, and especially as a timid sheep, it would be scary to me. I would think of discipline, authority. Um, it would just, they would be uh, things that might make me shrink back, right? But that's not what the psalm says. It says that they comfort me. So let's find out why. 
The rod is a short, sturdy stick or club. And I even read where that they might even have, um, uh, I guess, sort of like nails on the end of it. So it would make, you know, uh, weaponize it even more. So um, in Leviticus, uh, it talks about the shepherd counting his sheep, and it's for the purpose of tithing, okay? And that reference is Leviticus 27.32, if you want to. But I wanted you to know that that's not what I want to focus on, but he uses the rod, this short club, as one of the purposes is to count his sheep. And the, uh, it's to calculate his portion. Once every tenth, he would use the rod to mark the tenth sheep as he, that animal passed under the rod. And as the shepherd returns to the sheepfold in the evening, he holds his rod horizontally across the entrance just high enough for the sheep to pass under it one at a time because he's counting them. And if a sheep was missing, the shepherd would go look for it immediately. And that is part of what I heard in this. So this, um, this is how it's done. And it gives you more of a visual of, he, it's not of, oh, well, we're down to 99. No, he stops and he runs for that sheep. He cares for that sheep. Um, it's also to protect the sheep from wild animals and thieves, and that's what David told us about in those passages we read. <clears throat> so again, in that passage where he's talking to Saul before he goes out to fight Goliath, listen to David now talk about using his rod. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. He didn't do that with his bare hands. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, or, yeah, seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. David was strong, but he had a little help. So that's the rod was what he was using when he did that. Also then the staff, and I think we probably have a better visual of what that is. It's that long slender stick hooked at the end, right? It's what we all think of as a shepherd's crook or staff. So it was used also for two different purposes, to direct the flock. Sheep are notorious wanderers. And once away from the shepherd's watchful eye, they get into all sorts of trouble. Remember the sheep have keen eyesight, so they would be able to see this staff if they stay close to the shepherd. That's something you and I need to remember. We can follow him if we stay close to him. That's a comfort to me. And it's also to keep his sheep out of danger and close to him. And if a sheep became trapped in a precarious position, then the shepherd would loop the curved end of the staff around the neck of the sheep and retrieve it back to safety. Probably all of us have seen one of those reels on social media where the sheep goes down into, into the crevice and he's pulled out and he's right to go into the next crevice. Anybody here? Um, that's that's the, the tools that, of the trade, shall we say. I think it's a little more understandable now as why sheep might take comfort in these two things. They're not for defense and disciplinary and authority against the sheep. It's for the sheep. So perspective, right, makes a big difference. So one other thing about the shepherd, he has method. He leads the flock. He does not drive them from behind, encouraging them to follow him. So he's not a disciplinarian. He's not harsh with them um, because he knows them. He knows what they will respond to. He understands that they need a close relationship. The sheep will not follow a stranger's voice, but rather listen for their shepherd's calm, familiar voice. That's what we can do too, but we have to develop that hearing, if you will, and we also have to have that strong, close relationship with our shepherd. The shepherd is willing to lay down his life for his flock. Again, David proved that. That's what he was willing to fight a lion or a bear and obviously Jesus, is, as a good shepherd, did that. The shepherd is always attentive, not only to keep the sheep from straying or coming to harm, but he knows each animal's needs and what could be expected of them. So think about that. We can't all attain to the same level. We can't all have the same expectations. We're not all in our same spiritual journey, and God knows that. Jesus will meet us where we are. That's this. He knows each sheep's 
um, personality and what he can do. Um, and he will even go so far as carrying the young lambs inside his cloak to protect them, or as David said, put around his neck. Or was that the passage that Jesus said? So the shepherd is there for four things for the sheep, according to this right now. Um, another list, protection. And it's protection so they can rest. Because they're so timid and because they're so easily frightened, they will be on edge if they are not in a place where they feel protected and at ease. And so he understands that they must have their rest, so he has to provide that environment for them. The shepherd is there for the sheep's guidance. He moves the herd slowly. Oh man, did that resonate with me? Because I want to run. I want to get there. But again, he's got a hundred, for the sake of our conversation, a hundred to think about. And maybe I'm capable of getting there. Maybe you are too. But we've got to think about the others. And he does. So, and that's comforting as well to go, you know what? When somebody else wants to run ahead, he's thinking of me and knowing that maybe I can't when someone else wants to run too. He keeps the group's best interest in mind. Um, he's also there for their provision. Obviously, their food and water, but to tend to sick animals, to rescue the lost. We have a saying out there in the world, it's not about me. Well, it's really not about me when we're talking about this. It's about us, and that's how Jesus sees us. That's how our good shepherd treats us. Yes, he sees us individually, but he also understands we all have to work together for the good of the whole. And then he's there for their involvement. So that's the way sheep learn to trust, listen, and follow him. And we must go through this process as his sheep. We must learn to rest in him. We must learn to trust his guidance at whatever pace he takes. We must accept the provision that he gives to us. And, and then we have that close relationship. Um, and we can accomplish what it is he wants to take us through. This flannel graph that we're going to move characters through now, we have to have this basis. We have to have this relationship that these sheep and this shepherd have. So all of that, and we still have a little bit of verse 1 to go through. Um, I shall not want. If we have that relationship, and we've built on all of that that we just talked about, then I can understand now why the sheep says, I shall not want. There's a confidence in that, right? But what is it that he's, what is the want that he's talking about? It's lacking nothing. It's, it's not having any need. And it's not about the material things or even situations to resolve the way I want them as a sheep. It's specifically knowing that I don't lack the expert care and management of my master. He knows me and he knows what I need, and he will make it happen. Not at my pace, not necessarily the, the direction that I might take, but he will make it happen. So not wanting, in quotes, doesn't mean material riches, like I said, but rather if he is my shepherd, and I follow his voice, I will be well cared for, and I have no need of worry even in hard times, because whose care am I placing myself under? It has to be that willing following. I can be content and satisfied. I can put my full trust in him. That's the whole point. So a couple of scriptures to follow that up. Psalm 68, 19 says, Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Psalm 121, 4 and 5 says, Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And Matthew 10, 29 through 31, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God has used so many different pictures of how he has that intimate knowledge. Sparrows, 
hairs on our head, sheep. He, he knows everything you're going through. He knows what it's going to take to get through. And all we have to do is follow that staff. But we've got to stay close to him to see it. So that's the challenge to us, right? To stay close to him and not be easily excited or anxious to bolt whenever something startles me, if you will. I need to stay close to him. And sometimes that's counterintuitive because the enemy is right here, right? But he's there too. So that's a lot. That's a lot of information, but I hope you can see the flannel graph up here. And I hope you um, understand that referring to the sheep and shepherd relationship throughout this study will help us um, just see ourselves as we travel through this, this uh, passage. Um, it means so much more when we understand the intimacy that he wants to have with us and um, what that relationship was and, and that we can duplicate that same thing. Jesus wants that for us, his sheep. So there's some parallels that we can see already. I can hear and know my shepherd's voice. I know Jesus is good, gentle, and kind. He laid down his life for me. I can submit to his absolute authority and ownership. I'm confident in his leadership. He has made me his own. He calls me by name. He delights in me. And I will be content and secure when I follow him. So I hope that that has helped you understand a little bit of where I'm going with this. I really hope that we can all walk away from this going, man, I want that constant relationship. And I want to feel myself in these passages, in these verses as we, we study them. So I have um, on your table, there's a, a handout. We have a couple um, discussion, table discussion questions. And then if you have time and you want to go a little bit deeper, here are some questions and scriptures. But again, I'll be emailing everyone um, the lists and especially the characteristics of the sheep and the shepherd. So we'll take about, oh, 15 or 20 minutes and we'll wrap it up.